Okay, uh, very good. I think we can start uh, the panel discussion. There will also be a plenary discussion, so there will be plenty of uh, time also for questions. But we'll start with a little uh, introduction to the panel debate by very well-known Professor Sven Werner. Please, Sven. Thank you. Uh, my reflections for this, after these keynote lectures from these three contributions is that we are all living a fossil fuel society and we have a strong wish to enter the renewable society and we have to take the decisions every day about that direction. But unfortunately, our world is not perfect. We don't have perfect competition in this market. As Mark told us that the health cost and the climate cost for fossil fuels are huge. But we never use them. We compare options on the market. And how can we make a transition without this true comparison? Um, Nicola Stern made an estimation of the climate cost for many years. And when I compare his estimations, I just found that this were, it's only one country in the world that have a climate, that have a common tax that is in harmony with the future, future um, climate cost, damage cost for climate change. And it's Sweden. It's, uh, the current carbon tax is 120 euros per ton. The rest of the world should have the same level. Then we the, would have very easy decisions. Um, that is also valid for, for uh, district heating systems, that we are in transition from fossil to, uh, to uh, renewables. And district heating systems have made the fossil fuel society more efficient by using heat recycling. Heat recycling is a signature for district heating systems. But at the same time, district heating systems can be also used for, for, for uh, heat recycling in a renewable society. We can use the same method to make the renewable society more efficient. But however, these are also lots of challenges for district heating because very many times district heating is seen as a part of the primary energy supply. But it's not. It's a recycling industry. And if you don't, if you not acknowledge that, you can never assess this heating system properly. And it's valid very many times in examples. Some countries, for instance, that tax heat recovery, but if you release the heat to the, uh, to the environment, it's untaxed. It, it's, it's crazy. And, uh, and the accounting principles for any statistics in the world, they give all the benefits from this heating to the primary energy system. They cannot keep it anything themselves in the statistics. So nobody can read the energy statistics in the world and see the benefits of district heating. How can we expect that the world should embrace district heating? So in some way, if we're going to have a panel debate about the future role of district heating, at least we should have some kind of roadmap for the next five years, because they are very important what kind of direction we will have. This conference shows a lot, yet you have a lot of ideas. It's fantastic to, 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 to walk through, uh, between the sessions and listen to all the ideas, but it's kind of chaos. We don't have any uniform direction. We don't know where to go in some way. So we really have to some kind of guidance here in the panel debate. What should we do the next five years in order to reach our vision? That's in my input for the panel debate. Very good, thanks. Thank you very much. And I'll, uh, I will invite you, uh, Sven, also to uh, participate in the panel so you can also give the answer yourself, maybe a little later. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, I welcome also uh, Brian, who joined uh, the three uh, plenary speakers. I will not give the word to the panel right away. Instead, I will ask if there are any questions. And questions is very broadly interpreted here. It could also be comments, or even you could start answering the question from, from Sven, if you wish. And I can see we have a hand down here already. So, uh, 
police there. And I'll put you on the list. You too. If you'll just introduce yourself, name and position. Uh, Benedetto Anastasis, or researcher at TU Delft. Uh, my would be quite provocative question in the sense uh, towards this five-year planning, let's say, or in the near future. Do you think there is also the need already to plan how to phase out from the uh, fossil fuel-based industrial waste heat within the strategy while we are considering somehow, of course, once we identify that we have a waste heat source, not using it can be a problem, but how to go further? Otherwise, some, someone can argue that district heating is uh, keep in operation this old style uh, power plant. I think we'll take another question as well, or comment, and then we will sum up. Uh, we can, uh, Francois here first, and then you afterwards. Yeah, François Maréchal. Um, so, okay, I have a vision about uh, the future of the district heating, which is collect collecting the waste heat and harvesting heat in the environment and using heat pumps. Using heat pumps as soon as we can uh, for heating purposes, but also in the industry. So, uh, after heat recovery, that's the next step to do is to do the, uh, heat revalorization. And of course, it means that we have at least a system vision which is uh, broad enough. The reason why I'm introducing heat pumps is that it allows to access electricity. Electricity is, unfortunately, when it is uh, renewable intermittent, which means that the challenge is energy management, energy management and storage. And I would add something to, to, the, to the debate, is that today we, we know that we have to phase out fossil fuel, which means that we have no more the waste of the fossil fuel production, which is the, the uh, carbon source that is used by the chemical industry to make products. So it means that we will have also to reinvent a new source of carbon for the, for, for the system. And the, the new source is, and I will, will add something there, is that the, the petrochemical products are polymers. And the synthesis of polymers is exothermic. So it means that they are producing heat that we can use in our uh, systems uh, for heating uh, cities. And I'm talking about the northern cities that needs to be heated. So which means that my definition of future uh, district systems is the use of the buildings as a way to cool processes. Th thank you very much. And we have a third one here. I know I invited comments as well, uh, and that's, it's excellent to have it. Uh, please also make it uh, relatively short. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I'm Paul Eck from uh, USA, and I have a project. Uh, is uh, three, uh, three hectares. Uh, one half hectare is a solar panel on top of garage. Uh, the rest is, uh, say, two hectare of... Uh, maybe 100 dwelling units. So I'm, everything is being scraped off and we're starting from scratch. So where I look at the district heating, I'm trying to find, I, we already solved the accounting problem and we just say we will not burn anything for this project. So that leaves me with how do I make the choice for uh, best possible uh, assembly of components for my district heating. Thank you. Uh, I think now we'll take a round in the panel, and of course we can have in uh, mind the question asked by Sven, what should we do in the next few years, and also of course the comments we have had here. Could we start in, in your end, uh, Xiliang, and then go this way? So, so, so you so you're yeah. talking about, uh, yes. yeah, you're talking about uh, the, the, the planning for the next five, five years? I, I Actions. Yeah. Actions. Yes. Okay. What so, should you do now? Yeah, what do now? I think, yeah. So just uh, so in my presentation, so I just mentioned, I think, uh, so in China, really, how to say, first you need how to 
how to say, address the overheating. So the, the, the immediate action, I think, how to address the overheating. So in many uh, uh, cities, in many households, in many um, office buildings, I think it's a big, big, big issue. And, uh, and by treating the metering and the pair, uh, the metering uh, uh, method, so I think it could lead to a lot of significant change. And another, I think, is big concern for me is how to, because in China, that big stock of the capital, the big capital stock is a, is a coal, is a coal fired uh, system. The big the capital is very big. How to address it? Is, uh, how, to, how, to, how to address it? So, and uh, of course, in China, there, there, there is a good news in China. There's some, for the new, uh, how to say, building area for the space heating for the new building areas they, they actually in China they load, use a lot of uh, heat pump the heat pump use a lot of heat pump the technology and also the natural gas uh, CHP but for but for the what is the big uh, the story the, 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 the stock so for the current capital current system I don't know how to address this so because you if you swim from coal to natural gas it's very expensive in China, not like the United States. In the United States, the natural gas is very cheap. But in China, compared to coal, even not compared to coal, compared to the United States, the natural gas price is very much, I think it's three times of the United States. So, and uh, space heating for the, for the households is also an uh, issue for the government. It's a political issue, the political sensitive. They do not want to increase the, the the cost of the family. I think it's, it's a big trouble. Uh, it's, it's a big puzzle. Uh, I, maybe I would like to uh, ask uh, the panel panelists give me some give us some uh, uh, suggestions. It's, it's okay to answer uh, to add new questions to the answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's natural. <laughs> okay, so now there's a lot of questions in the air. It seems. <laughs> But uh, I think the main issue regarding the next five years, I, th I think uh, some of you may have heard the, this comprehensive assessments that are going on. I will concentrate on, on the European side right now. Um, so all the countries in the EU have to do comprehensive assessments, and they have to as assess how, how do we decarbonize the heating and cooling system. And I think, uh, uh, and how do we make a more efficient building stock? And I, I think uh, if we're talking about the next five years, this process that was started a few years back with mandating that the countries have to do this is so extremely important because it actually makes uh, the civil servant and national policy makers aware that there are options. And uh, we have been, maybe some of you saw the presentation, we have been looking a bit at how the status is and what what the quality are, and it's not very good, uh, to be honest, of those plans that have been made, but at least there is a plan and the, something has started. And what we have tried to do in, in the Heat Roadmap Europe projects is to make uh, ideas of how can you approach th this. And so I think for the next five years to improve these strategies is, is extremely important. But I would then add, maybe we need to have a, a ban on, uh, on putting up a new uh, gas boiler in an individual house in the European Union as a, as a means to stop the expansion and this inefficient use of such a valuable source. And as a challenge in the Danish case, perhaps we should start to talk more about the ash-free district heating also to address uh, your your question about the sources, which is actually possible if, if we want to do it. Great. Um, I'll address first the industrial question, the industry question. Um, so I think if we want to electrify everything, including industry, so if you electrify industry, which we want to do immediately, starting immediately, you're going to have less waste heat because the electricity is, doesn't have, there's no loss of heat of combustion. You just have the heat from the actual high temperature processes. So, so you probably want to actually electrify those industries first and simultaneously capture any waste heat. So I think that would be rather than you know, take these existing industries and just capture their heat and they still have their, their burning coal and heavy fuel oil, which is not very good. Um, and then in terms of five years, yeah, as Brian was saying, I mean, we need strong legislation everywhere to commit to going renewables or zero net energy buildings. And so I think once you have that legislation in place, it'll force solutions that have been proposed here. Uh, yes, yesterday, 
The uh, European Union has uh, finalized the goals for uh, renewables and uh, energy efficiency at 32% uh, renewables, 32.5% energy efficiency by uh, 2030. Uh, those are not uh, uh, very, optimis uh, very ambitious goals, but uh, they are better than what they were a few years ago. Uh, but the crucial thing in the next five years to put district heating in the right position in a clean energy package. Uh, that is uh, uh, one important uh, issue for us to do. Uh, and also to place more uh, 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 burden on the decarbonization of uh, heating, uh, which I think should go, as Brian has proposed, with banning uh, gas boilers in, uh, in uh, new homes uh, for now. Uh, 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 the critical thing also, what Sven mentioned, uh, is that we have to go uh, and look into the taxations and see what are the more sustainable way of taxing energy. Uh, and uh, 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 instead of taxing uh, energy used, uh, waste energy used, taxing waste energy not used. Mm. I think these uh, policy issues would help very much uh, the future of district heating in Europe. Okay, I have a long list of proposals, but I have to take the first most, most important one, and it's about the industry. We have a directive in, in European Union about uh, industrial emissions saying is that you have a new environmental permit you always should use best available technology. But today, heat recycling is not considered as heat best available technology. So I wish a small change in the, this directing saying that all new environment permits for new industries shall install heat recycling equipment today. Then we have it for the future because Industries use fossil fuels today, but they have to also to use uh, something that is new renewable. But the process itself can be uh, sustainable for the future if you have a heat recycling equipment installed. And actually, not all losses in the industry is from the, from the combustion side. If you have, for instance, a glass mill, 7% uh, of the input of heat goes out from the gate, it's locked, trapped into the glass. 93% is emitted as heat on the site. And that heat can be recycled. Thank you very much. And uh, I think we'll take an, an other round here. And I see the same hands, and that's very good. But I also see new hands. <laughs> I actually put mine. I, I put myself on, uh, on the list also, uh, but Henrik didn't notice it. But um, my name is Paul Ostergaard, Albu University. So looking at your presentations, there's one thing that strikes me. Um, <coughs> that is the conferences on smart energy systems and fourth generation district heating. And we've had some talking about smart energy systems. We've had some talking about uh, district heating systems. But the integration, um, I. I didn't see that so strong in the presentations here. Uh, of course, Nevin, you, you were talking about uh, Eastern Europe, and there we actually see a moving away from integrated energy systems. I mean, you, you are showing a decline in district heating systems. So you have district heating systems not characterized by CHP, so basically you are moving away from integrated energy systems. And Mark, uh, you showed your own house. And you, of course, have an integrated energy system, but you have an integrated energy system on a very isolated. I mean, you're building your own little energy island and not an integrated energy system on a more holistic level. So you're integrating across sectors, but you're not integrating into the overall energy system. So are we actually moving towards integrated energy systems? And does that go in line with fourth generation district heating? And that's a question for whoever would like to pick it up. Well, uh, you started calling my name. Um, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, I have to say that I um, agree with you, and I see it as a problem. Um, uh, the, the interest of uh, the gas uh, importer into Europe has become um, the major political influence in Eastern Europe. Um, and uh, that is actually moving uh, energy system towards its interest which is not European anymore. Uh, 
and uh, we should try to treat it uh, on a federal level because uh, it seems that uh, the national levels are not uh, strong enough. And as I have uh, shown, uh, bottom-up approach is not really working that well in Eastern Europe. So I want to point out that, well, in addition to, I mean, most of this conference is focused on large cities, but there's also a whole constituency that requires like microgrids, such as remote communities in Alaska and in Malaysia and in Africa, and also even army bases in Afghanistan where you have military, they have to just move and, you know, that takes like nine gallons of diesel fuel of tra transporting of diesel fuel to get one gallon actually used. And so that's a big waste. So there's a big effort also studying microgrids. And so there's value in looking at individual, if, whether they're individual homes and microgrids or small, communi small communities. But you're right, it's more efficient if, you know, if, if there is a district heating system, then I wouldn't need all those, um, all that just equipment. Uh, but the fact is there's not right now. So that's, how, do, how else do you set examples, uh, except for going to trying to make your own life renewable as, as possible. So it's a chicken and egg problem, but I agree yeah, on the large scale, if we can actually incorporate district heating as much as possible, that would make things more efficient. I think Brian will agree with me on that. I, I don't have any comments on this. <laughs> we, have another, we have another question here, so maybe we can take that. Um, Pierre Fogler, think I have an input more with regards to the structure of the conference. Uh, when we look at developing countries, a very, very strong message is district heating helps us a lot with health. But when I look at the content of the conference, I'm like the ecological dimension. I've seen one presentation that made like simulations on it, but we have no track on that. Whereas this, this is a very strong message that it helps a lot with this, and I think communication-wise. Uh, it's also something that we could uh, a word that we could spread a lot more and give space to people doing research on this um, and yeah for example also in climate action people were saying that the health effect of climate action is something that people pick up a lot upon and they might be like caring more about climate change just because it has uh, like health feedback that are quite positive so I'd like to have a bit of your reflections on how do we put um, health and environmental positive impacts of district heating into the picture within the next five years when we communicate it. Thank you very much. Should we take uh, a few other questions here? There are, there are people. <laughs> I'm so up here. I think I you're, still you're have one. Thank yeah. you. Um, Steve Ruby. But I install. Pardon me. I install um, what we call high efficiency gas boilers in residential houses in the United States. They are rated at 95% efficiency and people who can afford them want them. And it's, it's a sort of like a stigma, you know, you have the nicest or the best. What about transferring a rating onto these gas boilers around here and give them a label of how efficient they actually are as uh, maybe in, including the get the recycling of any heat that's being recycled, but determine a, put a label on them, point at them, yell at them, say, "Hey, you're only 43 percent efficient." You know, give them a a label, size them. That's an excellent size question. Them. That's can an we, excellent question for this I, panel here. Should we? I, uh, okay, you you. Since you, I'm a mechanical and, and engineer, we have comment on the other one, please. We have. Uh, uh, a way how we calculate the efficiency, which is called exergy. Uh, so there is no efficient gas boiler uh, because you basically burn well, high quality fuel to produce low temperature heat. Instead, we should produce electricity and heat uh, people with waste excess heat. And then you can get, uh, if you use heat pumps also to produce uh, uh, a low temperature heat, you can get between two to four times more uh, heating energy than if you burn gas. So there is no efficient gas boilers. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, we should ban them. Uh, regarding the, the, the health issues, uh, we can use it uh, since gas boilers are actually producing local NOx emissions, uh, and district heating is not doing that, so. 
Okay, uh, we, we have more questions, so I will proceed. Uh, thank you. Dermot McGuigan. I'm concerned about the adoption curve of these technologies relative to the impediment of ignorance and inst institutional obstruction and relative to the rate of emission of CO2 and climate change that we're reaching a critical point. Give me some good stories as to how this transition is going to occur before we fry the planet. <laughs> uh, I would like to, yeah, yeah, control. In fact, it's just a small comment following the uh, the answer of Nevin. So, in fact, that you were suggesting a tax, I think that we should tax the exergy destruction. And this would be yeah. mostly the best way of, of uh, really giving a value to all the energy resources that we convert to satisfy our needs. But please don't put it in laws, because that's complicated for uh, normal people. Uh, uh, device uh, taxes by experts based on exergy, I agree on that. But uh, exergy becomes complicated when you put it in newspapers, don't you yeah. think so? Exergy, ex uh, exergy is included in the law of the canton of Geneva. I know, I know. Yeah. There's uh, one more question down here. My name is Daniel, I'm from the Technical University of Denmark. I'm curious, you represent different continents and different uh, regulatory frameworks. Uh, so the transition regarding district heating, is that gonna happen under the same kinds of ownership and financing and regulatory regime, regardless if it's China or Denmark, or Croatia, US, Sweden, uh, your perspectives on, on ownership and financing and regulation in the transition? That's that's a question that can take um, some long answers, but so let's have some of them. <laughs> I think there was a question about this urgent sense of urgency. I'd just like to uh, address this. I think I think uh, we're all aware of that, and I think a lot of policymakers are becoming more and more aware of this. But I think our challenge is that we have to dismantle the existing. Uh, policies and infrastructures before we can start this. So, so unfortunately, I'm afraid the process is rather long. But what what we're trying to do here is to inform about the the, the technical and also regulatory options that are out there to try and push for it. But in if if I should say something in the European case, it is really frustrating to see how we can have. Uh, a list of public, uh, 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 it's called the PCI list. So it's a list of infrastructure who's, uh, that is a, like a public service or of interest of, of, of the people which the commission is financing. And it's both gas and electricity. And for somebody who works with an integrated energy system to have this kind of inducing gas infrastructure uh, all around Europe is really frustrating because there's no incentive to do this for the thermal grid. Uh, but this is of course because it's local. So there, so there are many policies that need to change before this can happen. But one thing that could be done is to say that if you have a plan to have renewable energy in your city, you are allowed to have a subsidy of like 10% just to get it to get things started. So you need some, some, some kind of icebreaker in the individual countries. I just have one remark for the regulatory issue. I think it's in also if I stay in Europe, it's interesting to see how uh, I think in the Netherlands they're trying different models, but it seems also that those that I speak with are realizing going over the different market models are realizing that you have to have some kind of local ownership and there is a problem with the profit margin. So it does not mean that the Danish system is adapted to the Netherlands. They will find their own way, but they're getting closer to what we have by realizing that it's not like selling a mobile phone. Well, I think. Uh, no, that's fine. Yes, please. Yeah, I uh, think. Uh, uh, 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Are you first one. Okay. I was going to try to answer the questions about the including the social costs of pollution and climate. Well, first of all, economics by definition must include social costs. That includes mm. climate and and air pollution and other environmental costs. Whereas business I mean, you know, business costs are different from economics. Business, so, and policymakers make decisions based on economics, not based on business. And so this is very important and it's very critical that there should be no analysis ever going forward that does not include the social costs of health and climate. And it's just wrong, it's plain wrong to have just a plain economic evaluation with a business evaluation, looking at the business cost without actually evaluating the economic cost. And that's because that's what policymakers should be making their decisions on, that's what they do, make decisions on. Uh, and really, just really quickly, the other question that came up was examples of, of transitions that are going on. There are transitions all over the world uh, going on, um, some slower than others. I should point out in 2000, well, Iowa is now 42% of its electricity from wind. In, 2000, in 2005, it was around 3%. And uh, California is now at 30% electricity from renewables. It was in 2012, it was at 12%. And it's by 2026, the new law requires 50% by 2026 and 60% by 2030. So there's going to be a rapid transition. In fact, they're, they're, they're shutting down gas plants right now, replacing them with battery, uh, batteries and, and renewable combinations. So around us worldwide, there are examples um, that are re really good examples of a big transition. South Australia uh, is another example. Even some places in South Africa and, and China, there's a huge growth, although there's still growth of coal. Uh, anyway, so you all know of some of the examples. Yeah. I agree with you, and I, my suggestion is that you include the social cost of health and climate in taxes to apply that on fossil fuels, because that's a very simple calculation how to do that after that. It's, uh, in Sweden, we have a very high carbon tax since 1991, and currently we have 1% of the heat demand covered by gas boilers at half a percent and 1% for oil boilers. The rest is, is heat pumps and biomass and district heating. So we have made the transition. Yeah. Oh, okay, uh, very soon we will have some very exciting awards to, uh, to announce. But before that we have uh, two questions here uh, or comments and then we will have the answers from the panel and then I think we will leave it there, but uh, one hand from you, Anna. Yeah, and that's from uh, Ramble. Well, I think we waste too much time to talk about small houses. We should be aware that uh, the future mega trend in the world is that people will move to cities. Cities are growing, which is a great opportunity to make cities smarter and to m make anybody aware that a normal infrastructure in a city is uh, also district heating and cooling. Uh, in in, in years, uh, 2000, whereas it 100 years ago was obvious that, that water and wastewater was a natural part of it. And the problem is uh, to convince the local authorities that, that they are elected in order to, to, to serve the interest of the landowner's population. In the U.S., they're not able to plan very much anything, actually, but the campuses can. The campuses in the U.S., they have all district heating and cooling. So that, that's a model for how to do when you have a, a, one authority who is, will do the best for an area. Uh, and thereby you can integrate uh, the fl all fluctuating renewable energy very cheap with storages. So in Denmark, w w uh, I mean, uh, NATO and the uh, US uh, campuses come to Denmark to see what cities can do because we have this local ownership uh, uh, forces which uh, actually do what is best for the landowners. And uh, I think in, in Netherlands they're also uh, beginning to think in that way. So we have to, uh, let's say, go the institutional way and make some good examples. Great. Thank you very much. We have another one here. Here's from Star Renewable Energy. I thank you to all the, the speakers over the last few days and the organisers and the people I've met around about. Um, two, two observations. The first is, you know, we, we, we've got to take a parallel perhaps with some of the other successes we have. The, the depletion of the ozone layer has been, has been stopped and reversed. It's because we identified what the problem was, we identified the quantity that we were still happy to use and drew a line between the two and phased down. So lots of talk about phasing up the right stuff. What we need to really have is a phase down of, of natural gas, in my opinion, and coal. So draw a parallel with that previous success. The, sec the second point um, really is, is more about uh, how, how the panel think we're going to achieve that. If we don't step up and realize what the problem is, 
then we've got absolutely no chance. So it's going to be about phasing down the wrong thing rather than talking about all the right stuff that we might do. What did the panel think of that, Steve? And we have one final question. Uh, yes, uh, Fabian Levin, uh, head of R&D at the utility in Stockholm, and you asked about good examples. Uh, we will be closing the last uh, fossil, big fossil unit by 2022, and then we are actually looking to go beyond zero CO2 emissions, operating a biochar unit right now, uh, co-producing district heating at minus 100 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Great. Now I think we'll have one final round in the, the panel. Who would like to go first? <laughs> <laughs> what happened here? Yeah. <laughs> you went, please. I think each of you should put up your priority list for five years and execute the first on the list, first item on the list. Then we make a change. Yeah, that's right. Considering how many we are, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Anyone else would like to final comment? Otherwise, I would like us all to give everybody, and you especially, a hand. Thanks. And I have, uh, I have here for for the plenary speakers. I have some some goodies. I know some of you are on planes, so you cannot uh, bring uh, wine and liquor, but. Uh, you are allowed to bring uh, chocolate uh, to the best of my uh, knowledge. So okay, you thank are. you. You may note that I'll not give Brian anything because he's part of the, uh, the organizers. <laughs> so uh, that's just too bad. But uh, we'll find out <laughs> afterwards. Thank you all very much. Indeed, yeah. Okay, um, now we have something very exciting to, uh, to happen, and that is to announce the awards. And here I will give the word to Paul, because I do not know anything about who it will be, so I'm very, very curious. Please, Paul. Thank you very much, Henrik. Uh, I know that this is what you've all been waiting for, because this is actually the most exciting point in the entire agenda, because Let's face it, uh, we've seen a number of presentations these last two days and of course some of the knowledge we have learned has been a little bit surprising but we, let's face it, we pretty much know which direction we ought to move. So everything that we have seen the last two days are simply uh, filling in a few gaps in something that we kind of knew already. So we know it now on a more detailed level. So it was not surprising. So what is actually surprising is uh, what is going to happen right now because we are a very small select group who actually knows who have won the prizes of the best presentations. So. We have uh, two different uh, prizes, one for junior researchers, one for senior researchers. Uh, don't ask us how to define those two terms because sometimes we have PhD students who are nearing 70 years old and, uh, and sometimes we have senior researchers who are 25. So, but we have uh, tried to group you into uh, junior and senior researchers. We have two different uh, prizes and we have a motivation committee for the junior. Researcher, we have, first of all, Sven Werner, you've already met him. Jan Erik Thorsen from Danfoss, who is also uh, <laughs> who is also the proud sponsor of this prize. Not, me Not you personally, but uh, you, you, I think you put, I, I think you put in an, a good word for us, so uh, I think you bear a certain responsibility. So, um, Let's give the floor to first Sven and then to Jan Erik to motivate the first prize here. Okay, that's the junior prize then. Uh, as I understand this uh, project was initiated by the German uh, state grant program about fourth generation systems. And uh, it's about the heat dispatch center in Rosenheim. And it's, it's a idea of how to meet the future in Germany. I don't know if it's a perfect example for Germany, but we liked the presentation. And it was performed by Britta Kleinetz 
from, I think it's Munich or, no? Yeah, Munich. Yeah. Please come from. And now we have to move to. Uh, okay, because we checks. have a small check here coming up. It's coming over here. Okay. okay, sorry. I will hand it over. So, Rita, congratulations. Fantastic. To follow it. And uh, maybe we put Sven in the middle. No, maybe you in the middle. Okay. We can keep it for you. Okay. Oh, I maybe need. No, it is turned on. Can I ask you one question? Uh, of course. <laughs> ah, okay. But I wasn't in the panel discussion. <laughs> no, 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 no. But I can ask one simple question. Are you surprised? Uh, sort of. <laughs> I mean, I was asked before whether I'm staying for the afternoon, so not really. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is, that is how the Germans they are. <laughs> they always know ahead of time what is going on. Yeah, yeah but still, it's. Um, thanks. Okay. Okay. Maybe one more question then. I mean, uh, one thousand euro is is a lot of money. And and can I ask on behalf of Danfoss, wh when can we sell something into your projects? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we might talk about that later on, not in public. <laughs> Aha! That already sounds like business, eh? <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. You're okay. <clears throat> You take it back? I can. So ma many men, they are so unpolite, never give it women flowers. <laughs> but now it's different. <laughs> yes. Okay. That's probably one of the work. You can have everything. So congratulations, and uh, it was worthwhile staying behind for the afternoon, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, it's, a, it's a nice hourly rate, I guess. So that was half of the suspense for this uh, afternoon. We have one, one more award to be given, and now I will give the word to Nevin Duick and also to Steen Schiele from Kampstrup. Uh, award to the senior researcher goes to a, a young senior researcher uh, who is very passionate about uh, power to gas technologies and how to use them uh, for energy security. Uh, he's so passionate about uh, smart energy systems uh, that he came uh, to this conference, although he is currently between the positions, so that means without funding, uh, and he paid uh, from his own uh, pocket. Uh, so, Benedetto Nastasi. Congratulations. I uh, didn't get the chance to see the, the presentation myself, but uh, you were nominated uh, by the means of, uh, of uh, bringing novelty into, uh, into the field of, uh, of smart energy systems. So thank you for doing that. And again, thank you for showing your passion. You are, are now the best senior presenter, and you're also a senior in terms of this conference because you have been attending all the, all the four conferences. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
So, thank you very much to the two of you also, and welcome. You, uh, I hope you also enjoyed uh, your, your little uh, s afternoon surprise here. So, uh, let's give a final round of applause for both our two award winners. And to all of you, I saw a number of your presentations. You can, you can sit down again. And I was actually thinking, post, there were quite some interesting presentations. And they, they varied, of course, all in novelty. They varied in terms of, of the ability to get the message across and so on. But I didn't really see any poor presentations. So actually, I think next year, to make the award committee a little bit easier, I think we'll have the worst presenter price because it must be so much easier to find the one which is poor rather than find the two which are excellent compared to all the other excellent presentations. So I, I'm considering uh, to make a major change uh, in the entire structure of the conference next year. So with that, uh, with that happy thought, I would like to give the word back to Henrik. I think he has a few final words to say. Well, yes, uh, the conference is now coming close to an end. But uh, before we leave, all of us, hopefully in good spirit after the conference here, there's something that is uh, very important to do. And uh, that is that uh, when we organize a conference like this, there is a lot of work. And there are some people who do more of that work than others. So for that reason, I would really like to invite Mette and Pernil and Marianne to the States. <laughs> it's, it's really, and I know all of you have been in contact with, with, uh, with you uh, during the process, uh, so you all know how much of work we have had here. So I have uh, been given by Mette some, uh, <laughs> chocolate. <laughs> some chocolates here, and now I have a sort of a problem because, and this is not very good when there are three people, the one chocolate is bigger than the other. So, uh, <laughs> but since it was Mette who gave them to me, uh, I, w I will compensate later on, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but you can uh, compensate by giving a big, big applause. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's really been a great job. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Let's have them on our yeah. I guess that was Brian's chocolate, was it? <laughs> no. No. Okay. So uh, now we'll uh, round up. Uh, I wish to say uh, thank you to all of you. I would like to say thank you to all the, the keynotes. I would like to say a lot of thank yous to all of you who helped uh, being chairman of the sessions, the session keynotes. A lot of my, all my pals who were, uh, helped uh, with all the technical things. Jakob who is sitting here in front uh, and, and a lot of other colleagues. So. Uh, Thank you all very much, and also all of you, thank you for, for turning up here. And before we end, I'll just say two important things. The one is remember to sign up for the newsletter if you haven't already done it. And I was just checking the home page you had. It's, it's very complicated, actually, to find it. No, maybe it was just me, but you had to go into on the news, and there you can find it. So uh, please go in on the news and find it, and remember to sign up. Otherwise, we will not be able to uh, send you the kind invitation for next year. And we really hope to see a lot of you on the conference uh, next year. And uh, I can assure you it will be the same team organizing it with the same topics and so on, even though we have those very uh, slight changes uh, in the title. So please remember to sign up and hopefully see you all next year and thank you for coming.